Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. We are starting a little bit on the early side. It's now right by about 5.50. Our speaker, I believe, is en route to us. He's not here yet, but we're going to start. So when we get here, we can get him started right away. Um, my name is Tim. This is the College of Complexes. Okay. We're going to do our, the college consists of the following format. We have a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who speaks. Then we have our question and answer period. And then we have our rebuttal period. My name is Tim. I'll be kind of helping out doing video and possibly some moderation tonight. Um, let's get started with the announcements. Tonight's speaker will be a consulate from the uh, Chinese Embassy here in Chicago. I'll give a more formal introduction when he gets here. So let's get started. Let's give a warm round of applause for our speaker this evening, Mr. Liu Jun, Deputy Council General for the People's Republic of China. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to be here with you this evening. And uh, before I start, uh, uh, I want to do a poll. How many of you have been to China before? Okay, good. Quite a few. Good. Yeah, Hong Kong part of China. Now it's the well, you know, the in the very recent past, the 19th National Congress of China's Communist Party has just concluded uh, on the 24th of, of October. So it's a week-long important event. Why it's so important? So today I'm going to uh, talk about. Uh, uh, this Congress, the why uh, I'm going to give you some some uh, some briefing on first why why this Congress is so important. Second, why the Communist Party in China could succeed and you know, in leading the people you know to the prosperity. And third, so I'm going to give you the during the Congress what are the uh, the guiding, guiding principle that the Communist Party of China is going to is going to observe. Uh, then, in this Congress, you know the party leadership and uh, together with the delegates, they come to uh, uh, a very good master plan for the China for the next uh, 30 years. Then I'm going to touch about uh, talk about the foreign policy of, of China. Uh, we want a peaceful uh, <coughs> development, peaceful growth, and also we need a peaceful environment, international environment. And last but not least, I'm going to uh, elaborate on China is an opportunity for the United States, it's not a threat. Okay, first slide. Yeah, uh, but those are key points I, I just went through. Next one. Yes, first, uh, why this Congress is so important? Uh, any one of you can, can give me uh, a hint why, why it is so important? Why? China has a billion people. There's a billion people in China. And uh, you probably have got the best growth you've seen since uh, the time, uh, since about 89 after the Berlin, after the, the thing, you've grown rapidly. Right, right, yes. The, we are, from the China's point of view, first, we are in a very important transitional period of time. So in the past uh, 30 more years, starting from 1979, you know, uh, when we started our opening up and the reform policy. So since late 70s, so, so Chinese economy has been growing at a very fast speed, you know, more than 10% every year. 
so and the economy is it's getting so big. So China is the number uh, uh, number two economy in the world, only second to the United States. So given such a big scale, the, and also given a very fast speed for the past 30 more years, so we have come to the stage that uh, we have to slow down. It's like uh, you're driving the highway. So, so, so for the past 30 more years, we uh, we've done a good job, but at the same time, we have accumulated a lot of the problems as well. You know, like, like for example, now we have the very heavy pollution in China. That's a that's a after effect, you know, of the fast growth in China. And also, we have some some environmental issues as well. You know, climate change. It's a, it's a very important issue in China now. So now we are trying to uh, try to make a structural change to, to our economic uh, plan. We try to make a st structural change, but it's not easy, you know, to to try to to do a job of structural reform. is not easy at all. So we try to move from a investment driven economy to a consumption driven economy. It's easy to say, but it's very tough. And also, in the past 30 years, we have received a lot of the other issues as well. You know, people are getting rich, and uh, they also have much more demand on education, healthcare, you know, many other uh, education, healthcare, and uh, social welfare. You know, uh, so, so we can see the government and the current party is facing uh, a lot of challenge. So, we must. Uh, stop for a while and come up with a new strategy. So this party congress, you know, is right to the point. The, so that's why this congress is, is, is so important. And uh, as, the, as the opening day of this uh, of this Congress, our, our President, our General Secretary Xi Jinping made a, made a speech for three and a half hours, three and a half hours, without, without any break at all. <laughs> and the, the whole report is about uh, more than uh, 30,000 words. <coughs> so, so that's a very comprehensive report on the past, on the past words, you know, on the on the guiding principles, on the on the future action plan. Anybody have read this report? In China, in, in English, it's a, it's a long, it's a long report. I, I suggest if you want to, to get to understand China uh, well, you got to, to read some latest uh, you know report on China, including this one. This is a very important document. I would say. So, so uh, this is, this is, this Congress is important, you know, uh, from China's point of view. Well, let's look at the rest of the world. You know, the globally we have seen uh, anti-globalization drive. You know, we have the Brexit. We have the uh, some uh, refugee crisis. You know, in the Europe. We have some very weak economic growth, you know, even in the United States, in Africa, in Latin America, and also we see a lot of the, you know, the terrorist issues, you know, ISIS problem in the Middle Middle East. So we see a lot of the uh, uncertainty, you know, around the world. But uh, you know, we must say that uh, China, for the past. Uh, uh, Recent years, China has been a very big uh, uh, positive energy. You know. Not only in the international trade, in the international finance, also uh, in the arena of international relations as well. So, for example, the China has been contributing to, uh, to the global economic growth by 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 30 percent for the past five years. So, China is a 
is, is the most uh, uh, robust uh, drive, driving force for the uh, world economy. And also in the past uh, uh, five years, where since 1979, you know, China has lifted the 700 million people out of the poverty. That's a miracle. For the past uh, five years, the about 60 million people have been out of the poverty. So, so, so that's a, that's a one of the achievements China has China has been made in the past the five years. Next slide. Yeah, next please. Next slide. So, so in the, in the Soviet Union, in the Eastern Europe, the, the, a lot of the socialist countries have failed, but China so far has been doing a very good job. We have a very good performance. So why? We are from, from our point of view, uh, we, are, we think we are building a socialism with the Chinese characteristic. The, where as, you, as you know, where that uh, since the founding of People's Republic of China in 1949, you know, China has been on the uh, socialist, uh, uh, has been a socialist country. So we, we think uh, by applying the Marx, Marxism principle with the Chinese specific condition, you know, we could uh, uh, we could come up with our own uh, growth model. So. So we are also committed to a people-centered approach. <coughs> so by that I mean the, we always attach importance to the uh, demand of the people. So we also so okay another uh, another thing we always we always put people first. We always always have the people first policy whenever. Uh, you know, we have a policy on education, the health care, you know, social welfare. They, they will try to put people's interests first. And also, one of the very important uh, uh, features that uh, we, we are doing a good job is that uh, we, we keep reforming ourselves. You know, for example, in the uh, past three years, we, when we have the very uh, fast growth, one of the very serious issues we are facing is corruption. Means the corruption is, is getting very bad in, in, the, in, the, in the past. But uh, in the last five years, the, the Chinese government, you know, led by our President Xi Jinping, has launched a, a massive anti-corruption campaign and uh, if you are following you know China I think uh, you will be aware that uh, you know this campaign has brought a lot of the high-ranking uh, officials uh, behind the bar you know, to the prison so so that campaign has been tremendous support from the, from the people so keep reforming itself is 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 very important, and also the in the past in the past five years, the Chinese government has come up with a lot of the uh, the reform uh, policy. You know, not only in the education, in the social welfare, healthcare. The for example, on the uh, anti-corruption front. Uh, we are going to establish uh, a new institution called the State Supervision Commission. So we are trying to strengthen our supervision on the super servant and uh, government official you know, on their conduct. <coughs> but this is this is not an easy uh, easy issue. But uh, we are very much determined, you know, to 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 move on. No, we think anti-corruption campaign is always on the way. It's, it's never have a have a have an end. That's our promise. And also, in the uh, past five years, you know, China uh, 
uh, not only in the economic uh, growth, in the social welfare, and also in the other important issues, China has has made a, a tremendous progress. The we have a, a what we call a, a China dream. So China used to be a, a Eastern giant, you know, a, a back in back in many centuries ago. So, but in the last last uh, 200 years, you know, so, so, so China has suffered a lot. Uh, the foreign invasion, uh, humiliation. So, so right now we think uh, we are we are trying to unite, you know. The all people in China and, and try to to achieve our national first national unification and try to to achieve the uh, China dream of national rejuvenation. rejuvenation. Yeah, next please. The the what are the new guiding principle for the. Communist Party in China and also for the government. The, in this Congress, the, uh, there are quite a few. Let me give you just uh, examples. First, the the party think the we should uh, take over responsibility. We we should not try to dodge our responsibility. You know, we think uh, given the such a. Uh, Globalization or circumstances, the the government's role is 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 very important because now we have the very uh, we have the new new technology, you know, IT. The the everybody has have to learn. Otherwise, you you will be drawn out the race. You know, every company, every country. It, 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 it's the same reason. So gov we think government should should take the lead in coming up with the, the new policy and try to make it efficient. Try to come up with a new policy. Try to implement efficient. So 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 we think number one, the government should play a leading role. And the number two, we think uh, we should continue to reform. You know, reform it. Is always a, a good recipe to our own own problem, and also in China, you know, we we are supposed to promote a law-based uh, governance, you know. and also the for the climate change, you know, we think uh, this is a very important and good issue, and uh, we should pursue a environmental friendly. Uh, growth, you know, instead of the uh, uh, past, you know, the the, the the growth, you know, which detrimental to to the, to the ecological system, and also we think uh, building up uh, in terms of the foreign policy, we think uh, uh, we should we we should not only we should shoot our responsibility. Uh, in China itself, we think we also should uh, uh, take over more responsibility in the international affairs. So we are trying to build a uh, global community with a shared future. So we think every given uh, this uh, uh, global village, you know, we think our interests are, are interrelated. We should. Uh, uh, we should do a good job at the method, but also we're supposed to care the others, the rest of the world, and work together to tackle the global issues. Okay. Uh, next <coughs> so, our action plan, you know, for the for the next thirty years uh, in this party congress. The, uh, we set up a goal, you know, between now to to twenty twenty. So we are supposed to finish uh, a moderate, <coughs> prosperous society in all aspects. 
Well, that's a literal translation of a, a Chinese expression. Maybe uh, that will make you a little bit confused. See, what we mean is, you know, by the year 2020, we were basically, you know, uh, having a, a way of society, you know. Everybody, almost the majority of the population were enjoying the a very a good living standard and uh, have the access, access to the basic education, uh, uh, health care, you know, social network. Uh, that's what we mean. So from then, from 2020 to 2050, in the next 30 years, we have the two step. We have the two steps. First, uh, in the first 50 years, so from 2020 to 20, 30, 2035, we are trying to achieve the modernization, uh, a kind of the low level modernization. So we we'll try to achieve the industrialization, try to achieve the agricultural modernization, the, try to have a relatively good IT technology level. So that's a, another level. Then the uh, from the 2035 to 2050, so so by by the 2050, that's the very important uh, period of time because people about China was established in 1949. So by 25, that means centennial anniversary for the founding of Republic of China. So by that time, we wish we will be a. Uh, uh, a great modern country, prosperous, strong, democratic, harmonious, and beautiful. So that's our. Uh, so in order to yes, please. Okay. In order to achieve uh, this objective, so we think uh, right now we still focus on domestic, uh, economic uh, uh, issues. So that's our uh, prime uh, the, the target. So we think uh, we will pursue a peaceful growth. So and also we try to uh, to create a, a friendly international environment as well. So right now uh, we think our state status quo is. We still as the biggest, uh, we still as the primary stage of the socialism. So, 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 in order to, to build communism, first we have to build the socialism. And right now we are still in the very initial stage of the socialism. So that's what we put out, you know. Uh, and also in the world, we are still the biggest. Uh, Developing country as well. Developing country. So let me let me ask you. Anybody know uh, one bad one road initiative? Yes. Yeah. 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 I what can, is about? Uh, it's what it's about your expansion of getting the Silk Road going about from China to Europe. Uh, through initiatives by helping the other countries in the middle and in, in Central Asia develop a rail and road network and then on the sea lanes getting more trade with the uh, with with the things opening up of your ships and your other containers around the Horn of Africa just to get more uh, trade that way too as well in other words your shipping is increasing your foreign policy is going more towards integration of Europe and yourself and you're also helping with the development of several countries in Central Asia. Yeah. Right, right. Very good answer. So why why we, we pursue uh, this initiative? Where it's, it's, it's simply because it's not a it's not a Cold War kind of strategy, you know, try to have our own uh, sphere of influence. No, not at all, you know. Because we simply we think uh, China has been doing a good job in infrastructure building, mm -hmm. upgrading. So, so for 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 those who have been to China, 
Have you tried the high speed train? Bullet train? I have. Yeah. Not in China. <laughs> I've heard a lot. I watch a lot of China Central National TV, and I know about right. the extensive growth of your rail right. networks and your roads. My, my hometown is, is a small city close to Shanghai. Well, when I was in college, it took me about 15 hours, you know. Uh, oh, thank you. Where are the, where are the, it, it took me 15 hours overnight uh, from Shanghai. So first up, I have to go to Shanghai. Then I take a, take a uh, at that time it call, it's called also express train from Shanghai to Beijing. It took me 15 hours. But now, by high speed train, so how many hours do you, you would imagine? Four. 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 Yeah, four and a half. Four and a half hours. So, so from, from Shanghai to Beijing. Wow. It's about uh, 1,200 1, kilometers. I don't know how many miles. 700 miles. About 7,800. 7,800 miles. Only four and a half hours. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Build that here. Good build that in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> the, the in Chicago, the one of the high sp high speed uh, uh, train builder in China, CRC, is having a plant in, in south of Chicago. So that company is going to replace all the passenger cars of the CTA. In so by the by the 2020, you will see brand new CRC. Car, you know, for the CTA for the transit. Is it been rebuilt yet? <coughs> but uh, not the high speed. Uh, no, I mean the CTA. Yeah. Is it built? Yes, yes, it's been built now. Yeah. So that's our contribution to this country. Thank you. So, 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 so we think uh, on some on some things that we are we are doing good in China, we we, we should have the others in in the whole Eurasia. A big uh, continent in, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, and also the marine, maritime road, you know, the power facility. We think uh, we should we should contribute to upgrade the, those facilities to by improving the inf infrastructure capability. We think we could have a more robust international trade and. Uh, which will benefit everybody, not only China. So China is good at that. So we would like to have the other to, to improve their infrastructure. So that's the international you know, responsibility we think we should have. So, so the basic norm you know, governing our foreign policy is we think we should have the mutual respect for each other. But only for the uh, territorial integrity, the, the, the sovereignty, but also the, the, uh, any any controversial is issues, we should, the, any international system should based on the fairness, justice, and uh, the win-win <coughs> cooperation. I moved for shooting it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. The, the, finally, we, are, we think uh, for the past, you know, for the past century, China, China has been uh, contributing, you know, peaceful for the global peace. So in the future, China will remain so. The, we will still pursue an independent foreign policy of peace, and we we will never enter into any military alliance alliance with other countries. For the, the, the wide Chinese opportunity, you know, just now I, 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 I gave the example of the One Bear, One Road uh, initiative. And also, the, now given the Ch China, China is the second biggest economy in the world, so we, in the, in the next five years, you know, China China will import a lot. So, so you, you can see China can right. will import about eight million US dollars, you know, product and services. So huge market, huge market. 
Yeah. Oh, by the way, let me give you ask a question again. Uh, now somebody talking about the new four great invention in China. You know, there's an ancient uh, four invention in China. You know, you know what are they? Um, I I'm not quite under. You know, gunpowder, oh, yeah, yeah. printing, right. paper making, right. and, and compass. Yes, compass. Yes. That's a, mm -hmm. old uh, four invention. But now we have the new one. Somebody talking about this new four invention. One is high high speed train. Second is the online shopping. Uh -huh. but online shopping in China is, is everywhere. Yes. And also electronic uh, payment. Now in China, whenever you go, you don't need to bring your, your your paper money, no credit card even. You just bring your, your cell phone. It works everywhere. For all the payments, all the payments, any even flea market, you can pay by yourself. So high speed trend, like, uh, electronic payment, Online shopping, and then you had a fourth one. Online shopping, final one is the bicycle sharing. Ah. <laughs> bicycle sharing. Any, anybody in, in Beijing in recent months? I was in Beijing in August. So, on Beijing Street, you can only use your cell phone. You can unlock a bicycle and drive within, within one hour. It's free of charge. Everywhere is OFO. Uh, bicycle or mobile bicycle. Is that sort of like our program here in Chicago, what they call the Divi program, D I V Y? Right, right. right. The oil will try to enter the, the, try to come to Chicago. Ah. But it's facing the competition of the yeah, the whole system. And what is. I, I'm forgetting, but what's the largest online retailer in China? I, Alibaba. That's right, Alibaba. Yes, Alibaba. Yeah. Alibaba. What we call T-Mall, right? Yeah, we, online uh, mall. It's a T-Mall, T-Mall. Okay. It's the biggest. The, let me give you an example. In November 11, November 11 is the biggest online festival, shopping festival in China. Every year, November 11, we're in single day, in single day, there are about uh, 500 million worth of the goods were sold in that single day. November 11, what we call the bachelor's day, because oh, Black Friday. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very interesting phenomenon in China. Next slide. So, oh, I'm so sorry. not only China is going to import a lot, but also China is going to invest a lot. And also in the uh, next five years, uh, Chinese outbound tourists will be, will, be, will be more than five million people. So that's huge. Yes. Yeah, that's huge. This, the Chicago, Chicago is, is, is trying to attract a lot of the tourists from China. In the early this month, we have the Chicago Marathon. For the last year's Chicago Marathon, there were about 500 Chinese runners participating. But for, for this year, you know how many coming from China? 1,500. <laughs> so triple. So that's amazing. So, the, by the end of the 2016, there are about over 200,000 Chinese tourists coming to, to Chicago. Yeah. But uh, at a growth rate of 25%. So China is the, one of the biggest potential markets uh, for Chicago tourism. Okay, that's all for my, for my speech. Okay. But, uh, all right. I, all right. Getting the questions now. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Get over here. All right. I got a question. Moderate questions. Okay. Um, the first one I'm going to have for you is: Can you just give us a little bit about your background? Mike. 
We're going to, I'll turn the camera on you in a minute, okay? The first one I want to ask you is, can you give us a little bit about your background and why you entered the service of the Chinese government? In other words, a little bit of background about yourself. Sorry for that. I should give you my background information at the beginning. Uh, I graduated from the Foreign Affairs College in Beijing, and I entered Foreign Service in 1993, so almost uh, one quarter of a century time. My first post in uh, South Korea, Seoul, uh, from 1996 to 2000, I spent four years. And I, I went, so during my stay there, I, I went to the Panmunjom, you know, the, the, the border with North Korea. So I have some understanding of the North Korea issues. I spent four years in Seoul, South Korea. Then uh, I spent two years in, in New York. Uh, no, no, I, I spent five years in New York City. So that's my second second post abroad. Well, we will rotate. We will stay in Beijing for, for a few years. Then we, we go abroad for a few years. So we, we rotate. And so this is my third post. So I've been to Chicago for three years now. So probably I have one more year. Oh, okay. That's my background. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go. I'm sorry, I forget your name. Jean. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned tourism, uh, and you mentioned a lot of uh, Chinese go to our tourists. Is it uh, the average? If the average Chinese person could they easily get a passport? and travel outside of China without difficulty, getting to the, if they have the funds. The, well, let me first, uh, before I answer your question, let me first, let, let me give you some uh, statistics, you know. So, just now I mentioned uh, for the next five years, we are going to have seven million, no, 700 million tourists, uh, outbound tourists. So that's huge. So that means in each year we will have more than 100 million people visiting abroad. So starting actually starting from the 1214, you know, China's outbound visitor has has been over 100 million people each year. That's that's a huge number. So if any. If, it, if the Chinese cannot uh, apply passport, how can they go abroad? <laughs> okay. Thank so you. No problem at all. And Mike Flores. Thank you. Hey. Um, I saw the movie I Am Not Madame Bovary, a uh, Chinese movie. It was about what couples had to go through in order to have another child while the government was telling them they could only have so many children. So the whole movie is about how they got a divorce and tried to remarry so they could break the rule and have another kid or a daughter. Um, perhaps a Bill of Rights <coughs> would help in China, but I do have a question about North Korea. <laughs> North Korea, as we know, their main export is crystal methadrine, okay? A narcotic more addictive than cocaine. That's their main export item. How do you keep that out of China is my first question. My second question is, I discovered on the internet quite by accident, and I'm sure I wasn't supposed to read it, several generals from China wrote a paper after 911 praising Osama bin Laden for showing, and the Saudis, for showing that you could use a third party to attack an enemy without being traced. And they talked about the Saudis and 911. Now my question is, where did North Korea get the information, the science, for the nuclear and H-bomb weapons that they have now. Who gave them that material or who had it stolen from them? But where did North Korea 
come up with an H bomb when the Russians couldn't do it without stealing the data. Okay. Right. Well, well, Danielle, Danielle, for example, you're not Korea issue. But this is a very important issue. You know, next month, uh, the President Donald Trump will be in China. The North Korea nuclear issue will be uh, top issues. The two videos we are going to discuss. The, for certainly for, for, for China, we, China is North Korea's close neighbor. We don't want, we, we do not want to see a nuclear North Korea testing nuclear bomb, you know, that might create a disaster for, for, for China because we are very close to North Korea. They certainly try to stop North Korea uh, having a nuclear bomb is, is, is a priority. We are, we are trying whatever uh, necessary to try to, to, to... Well, it failed because they have... Okay. We got to the Let him finish answering his question, Mike. But that's a very complicated issue. I could, uh, we could discuss for, for long. But certainly, we think uh, for the North Korea, security is, is their pri primary concern. China is, is not going to provide security uh, for the North Korea because we don't have the uh, military alliances with North Korea. Who can provide? Who can uh, make uh, North Korea feel that they are safe? The United States. We think the United States should talk directly with North Korea, try to elevate their, their security concern. But now, you know, we see the escalation, not the tension. And rather than they come to the negotiating table to talk, we have the six nation uh, dialogue mechanism available all the time. China is taking the lead, trying to bring all party concern to, to the table to talk. But uh, the United States say, okay, North Korea, uh, Break the, break the rules, and uh, so the two sides set up a precondition for the talk. So that's, the issue. that's the problem. Well, North Korea is threatened. All right, so Mike, 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 we're going to have to move on. Sid. Um, why did you, in your opinion, about the Soviet Union, why do you think it failed? Why did the Soviet Union He's asking failed? why the Soviet Union failed. Yeah, the the, a lot of people try to compare, you know, the China with the Soviet Union because those of us were the, the, the socialist country, but uh, we think we are different from them. The the you know, as I said in the uh, a few minutes ago that. Uh, we always try to put people first. You know, so why uh, Soviet Union failed? Because the that government is no longer uh, supported by the people. So that that government failed. Why we we succeed? Because we always put people interest first. So we try to we always try to to adapt ourselves to the. To the times, you know. So are we trying to upgrade ourselves? So, for example, we have the 21st century. And we have the new globalization uh, backdrop, background. So, so we should study this, this, this new time, you know, new trend, a uh, new mega trend, and try to, 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 to improve our governance efficiency. Try to improve our policy. So always try to put people's interests first, and then we think uh, the the Chinese government, including the Communist Party, are always being supported by the people. So that's why we can succeed. They feel okay, Charlie. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Lu. A year or two ago, I reported here on the working conditions in the Foxconn complex in your country and there were some reports that working conditions were less than perfect. Do you have an update on what's going on? International labor organizations 
were prohibited from entering the premises. <coughs> or in general, how are working conditions? In Wisconsin. How are working conditions in your country compared to us? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 as a responsible government, we always attach importance to protecting the rights of the work of the labor. You know, the, you know, in China, I, I can tell you, we have the, uh, a very big uh, number of the migrant labor. So, so in China, we are different from the United States. You know, in the countryside, in the we are now we are going through a, a tremendous urbanization. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, they are the farmers. They come into the city to, to uh, So we are still in the process of 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 grand urbanization. So almost every year we have we have about uh, uh, twenty or thirty million people move into the city. So that's a tremendous challenge for the for the government. You know, for example, in Beijing, you know, ten years ago, a migrant worker will not have access to the public education, public uh, uh, health care, but now they can. So, so I don't know the details about the first first come uh, plan in, in China because because China uh, there's so many events happening. You know, I cannot follow all the news. But certainly the, our, our principle is that we will try to protect everybody's rights. Okay, okay. Uh, the gentleman in the back, and then, then we'll go to you next. Yeah, uh, in the back, and then we'll go to you next. I grew up in Poland, so I have my own experience of the Soviet Union working. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was part of the Solidarity Movement. I even wrote the book in 1980 about how the bill, that Soviet Union will fall apart soon and what Poland uh, should do and get prepared for. And the part of the book was that I'm sometimes joking that I invented the Chinese solution that I said simply that within the concept of socialism, like it was in Poland, the elements of the free market can be implemented, and then, you know, the country can prosper. But in my thinking, and people like me, was that this was a little bit of the trick to get socialism out. Because I agree with you that China reached tremendous progress in the investment, in the stage of growing, in the industrialization. Uh, South Korea was also a totalitarian country and very strong central government uh, at the time when they were building their industry. But right now when they are, for the last 20 years, they're going into the market economy, what China is entering, I believe that those ideas of socialism uh, simply will be conflicting with the goals which you put. So I'll be interested to hear your comment on that. I have one more question. No, in, uh, when it comes to China, in, uh, the tradition of Confucius uh, uh, was kind of big part of traditional China. I know that during the uh, Maoist Fortuna Revolution, Confucius was kind of you know turned down. I'm wondering how those old traditions of Confucius are right now functioning in China. Okay. All right. Let's yeah. let him answer, okay? Okay. The, if you if you read the uh, 19th Congress, Party Congress report in the main by uh, President Xi Jinping, you were you can you can read in line about uh, the uh, about the some content on the uh, the classical. <coughs> the Chinese culture classicals. The, uh, you're right, recently there, there is a revival of the, of the Chinese classical culture. But certainly that, that does not conflict with the socialist, socialism at all. We, we don't think that, that they are contradictory to each other. We think that 
that actually, in fact, is complementary to each other. The, the, in the traditional culture, we think uh, the, uh, there is something both good and bad. You know. the, the Chinese government, uh, uh, right now, well, for example, you know, my boy is, 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 is in elementary school. You know, on his textbook, you, you, you can see a lot of the, like, uh, the, 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 the textbooks, you know, on the classical, uh, uh, classical culture. And also in Beijing, there is a Confucius Institute. So a anybody heard of the Confucius Institute, right? Yeah, that Confucian Institute is devoted to the Chinese language teaching, both in China and abroad. So now in the United States, we have about 100 Chinese Institutes in the universities in, in, in the United States. So we, we, think, you know, we cover nine states in the Midwest. There are about 20 Confucian Institutes uh, in our council district. Okay, Neil. Okay, Neil. Yeah. Um, I have not had the pleasure of seeing China myself, but my father served in World War II in China under General Stilwell, and he had a very, very high opinion of the Chinese people. You, you began your talk saying that the Chinese system is Marxist. And it's very famous that Marxism is material, dialectical materialism. I'm curious if the, the foundation is material, why is there a law that a Tibetan cannot reincarnate into a new incarnation without government approval? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get your question. In, in Tibetan culture, they believe in reincarnation, that when a person dies, their spirit can be reborn later in another person. And some of the most honored people in Tibet, uh, according to their tradition, have reincarnated many times, 10 or 20 times. China passed a law saying that Tibetans are not allowed to reincarnate without government approval. And I'm, that, in my ignorance, well, sir, sir, I, I think you have confused the confusion with the another language. Yeah. Okay. The, the Tibet is it, for 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 the central government. Tibet is issue on the our our territorial integrity. Somebody trying to separate Tibet from China. Somebody trying to pursue independence of Tibet. Which, are, which we are firmly against it. That's a different issue. Um, if you are a materialist, how can you pass a law against the United Nations? Okay. All right. Move on. All right. All right. Move on. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I forget your name. His Michael. Name Michael. Michael. I'm sorry. Michael Cannabis. I know. Um, we know that the United States and Japan are very friendly. And we know that Japan and China do not particularly like each other. There have been a couple of books recently that talk about the inevitability of war between China and the United States. One by Graham Allison and another one by Gerald Baker. Do you have a sense for the political feelings over there, not in a room like this? What's really going on between, for example, Japan and China? Can you repeat the question? Well, you know, China and Japan are neighbors. Yes. We are only separated by the Sea of Japan, you know, pretty close to each other. Unfortunately, we, you're right, right now we don't have a good relation with each other. Why? Well, simply because Japan invaded China in the 1930s and 40s, the Second World War. And uh, after the war, the Japan is not like Germany. Germany was totally destructed, defeated, right, by the airline forces. But Japan is different. Japan surrendered by 
in the wake of the two atomic bombs, Japan surrendered. So Japan, Japan's militarism was not thoroughly liquidated. So, so, so Tokyo is not, you know, distracted or completely uh, conquered you know, by Allied forces. So, I would say, after the Second World War, Japan does not uh, revisit its militarism, no. militarism, and uh, and also due to the <coughs> Cold War, you know, due to the Cold War history, the. The, the Japanese government do not have a, have a, uh, do not, do not have a very, the, uh, acknowledgement of its war history. So on this important issue, the Japanese government and also its leaders always have some very, uh, wrong remarks, you know, it hurts the feeling of Chinese people. For example, the Japanese leader uh, has paid tribute to a war shrine, which we cannot accept. Okay. So it's 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 history. Uh, it's comments. There is their knowledge on the history issue is the biggest barrier for the two countries have. Uh, Okay, Mike. Two quick questions. I, um, Fo 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 Foxconn built a factory, I think, in Wisconsin recently. Uh, my questions are: one, are unions illegal in China? That's one question. And then my other question is: uh, you know. Trump likes to, uh, you know, drive trucks and dig coal. Are you guys going to put Trump on a bullet train? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Well, I'm, I'm not participating in preparing for, for President Trump's visit, but I'm sure he will he will get very good treatment in, in, in China. The, the, he only, as far as I know, his visit is only about two two days long, and I, I'm not sure whether he will have time to, to travel from Beijing to another city, you know, by a bullet train. I'm not sure. Be nice. But certainly, I, I wish he will have some personal experience of, of, of that. And then, well, right. on your first question, so yes, China, we do have the, we do have the union. Yeah, we do have the union. But uh, again, you know, it's not a union that uh, you will apply your standard to, to ours. Oh, we don't have a union. They're company union. Okay. Dennis, you are next. Well, thank you very much for your informative presentation. I've got two interrelated questions. What can we do to get the Chinese government to support a worldwide ban on shark finning so we can save the imperiled shark populations? And the second is, what can we do to get the Chinese people to give up shark's fin soup? <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. The, 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 you're right, Chinese cuisine is very, very rich. The, the everybody likes uh, Chinese food. And also, unfortunately, you know, shark's fin is one of the good uh, Chinese uh, dish, you know, the, the, in our culture. The, the, but uh, I can tell you that uh, China has joined a lot of the international convention on, 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 on the, 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 the shark killing uh, pre preventions. The, and also, I can tell you that uh, in the in five five years since since our government come up with the very tough anti-corruption campaign, the shark fin consumption has been reduced tremendously. Yeah. That's good news. Okay. You're next. Yeah. Okay. We're having problems in our country with uh, our health care system. So I'm wondering what problems do you have and how do you deal with them in China? Yes, that's a very good question. You know, uh, in China, as I told you, uh, we are different from the United States in terms of the, the, the health care system. The, uh, our problem is a lot of the very good uh, the doctors, uh, healthcare resources are concentrated in the cities. So
So you, if, you, if you are living, living in a city like Beijing, Shanghai, you have access to the very good doctor and system, and uh, your, your, your sickness could be treated uh, with a very good uh, uh, method. But for those who are living in the countryside, in the poor area, you know, they, are, they will feel a little bit unfortunate. So that's our problem. So we are trying to tackle this, this problem, you know, by first by trying to uh, increase the urbanization process, you know. Second, try to reduce imbalance, you know, between the city and the countryside. That's it. Okay. And uh, I think I had Andy was next. Another very good uh, question and issue. And I have to keep you short on because for one issue I could talk uh, for 30 minutes, half an hour. Okay. All big issues. Okay. Our speaker will have to leave about 7.20 to get to another engagement, so keep your questions short if you can, please. My, my, question, my question is, yes. um, does the Chinese medical system allow, allow a huge price gouging for pharmaceutical companies so if somebody can't afford their medicine, they just die? Is your system different in that respect than in the United States? We have a for-profit system here. I wonder, is it a for-profit system where drug companies are just allowed to make billions off the side? Well, the problem you mentioned, uh, well, according to my personal experience, I, I do not encounter that problem. Uh, but uh, for some, like, uh, like, uh, uh, I do heard of, you know, I do hear of some something that like uh, uh, people who suffer from cancer, uh, if the medicine was not covered by the medical insurance, you know, he had to pay in order for his own pocket. Uh, that's also the, 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 the issue in China. But uh, right now, you know, for the, go the company try to, they is try to, to put, uh, it's try to negotiate with the uh, pharmaceutical company, you know, try to nego negotiate with them. But when they try to reduce the price, we will try to put that medicine into the coverage. So that's one of the uh, solutions that we can offer. All right. Um, you, are, you, you two have already had questions. Go ahead. But I have one better one. What? I have oh. one very good one. No, but we're, we're, we're trying to get everybody oh, okay. to answer that question first. Yeah, you haven't had one. Go ahead. I haven't. Who has it? Who, who's next, Tim? Is it Dave Zucker? Who? I, I wanted to ask you, is there uh, any uh, long-term uh, commitment or solution to uh, Taiwan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this, this is very important uh, issue, issue for us. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, long you know, on this issue because this is very important. First, let me give you a background of the current uh, Taiwan uh, across the straight uh, situation, you know, relation between Taiwan and the, and the mainland. The, now in Taiwan we have a new party, a new ruling party called the Democratic Progressive Party. You know, that party, they try to pursue the independence of Taiwan, so try to separate Taiwan from China. Uh, so, in terms of the economic relation between Taiwan and China, the, the Taiwan is getting more and more economically dependent on, on, on the China. So, so, the people, uh, in Taiwan, they could travel to mainland to do business, and the, the student from Taiwan, they could go to the university in, in, uh, on the mainland to, to study. So, so between us, there are a lot of the freedom. You know, there are, we have come up with the many uh, uh, measures try to promote the economic, you know, culture, trade links between each other. But uh, the, the for the moment. The, 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 the current government in Taiwan is, is on a very dangerous, dangerous course you know, uh, for, for the independence, you know, which, 
which which might pose a uh, very danger even for the China-U.S. relationship. The why? Well, well, because the the if the Taiwanese continue on that way, you know, pursuing independence, you know, then we have to use both. That's that's a problem. Your question? Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I, I'll make it short, sorry. Um, Just real quick. When, okay, when Trump was elected, the first thing he did was call and Taiwan and offer to sell them bombs, right? And that, that's Trump's policy that obviously I'm concerned about, and I'm, but I guess I'm like, you know, this militarism, I think they deliberately try to create wedges between China and Taiwan. And I, I noticed on your website, I'll get to the question, that you, a wonderful website that has, you know, that a lot of issues are kind of false issues created by propaganda or the, you know, about Taiwan or Shengfi or the um, Tibet and, um, I guess, do you use public relations? I wish we, we could help you do more public relations to stop our militaristic deep state from okay. waging war. Right, I, yeah, I thank you for raising that, that okay. question. Just the, you know, when, when China established a diplomatic relation with the United States in 1979, you know, one China uh, principle was there since then. So, so one China, one China policy is the is the fundamental principle, you know, uh, for the U.S.-China relations. The, the, the. But uh, unfortunately, you know, the 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 some 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 Taiwan separatist organization here, they they have a uh, they have a lot of campaign try to. To, to lobby the Congress and also some some, some uh, congressmen, some elected officials in the capital here, they also uh, have a lot of sympathy to Taiwan and also try to to improve the U.S. relation, even military relation with Taiwan, which which is very unfortunate, which is, is very risky. So that's that's my uh, put. Your right. China relation in in, in in danger. All right, next. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you. Yes. No picture. No picture. No pic. No. No tape. No pictures. All right. Come on. Ask the question. Come on. Ask the right. question. Come on. Without okay. All right. All right. Tiananmen Square, 1989. Tiananmen Square, in 1989. A million years. Is there? Yeah, a billion years ago. Was the true history ever? Put forth where thousands of students are killed by the government? No? Oh, that's my question. Why don't you ask about Joshua Wong? He just was on prison. One pull at a time, please. Yes. And was last week. All right. About 20 years ago. I think he's just asking about Tiananmen your thoughts Square. on the really well, well, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the right now, the China is. is is, is doing a good job, you know, in, 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 in tackling all the poverty issues, the economic uh, issues, you know. They're doing a good job, you know. So history will, will prove that uh, we, are, we, are, we are managing the good, you know, at that time. Um, question. Uh, Mike? Wait. Uh -oh. Let's go with our people who... Oh, he pointed at me. That's why I raised my hand. Uh, no, no. Jonathan has an ask. No, no. no this, you, you, you're next. Thank you. Hey. Uh, my hey. question is, <clears throat> what in your opinion, in your government's opinion, needs to be done to bring peace and quiet to the Korean Peninsula? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, we think uh, first, uh, we, should, uh, we should have the dialogue instead of the confrontation. We think all the international conflicts should be solved in a peaceful manner. So we should come to the table to negotiate. Second, right now the United Nations has come up with quite a few resolutions, you know, 
try to uh, try to bring North Korea to the negotiating table and also try to to reduce the risk of the uh, of, of uh, military option. So every country should uh, should observe the uh, the United Nations conventions, and we should work together. You know, and for China part, for our part certainly, our relation with North Korea is a very normal one. It's it's a it's a very normal country to country relations, and uh, so far we have exercised a very strict embargo on the North Korea, you know, according to the United 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 Nations. Uh, 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 conventions. The, it's a very tough issue, and uh, sometimes we should think think about this issue, uh, put, putting our shoe, putting our foot on their shoes. You know, we should look at the uh, uh, situation, the situation uh, from the other perspective, and try to have an open-minded approach. So. But, uh, you know, I stayed in, in South Korea for four years. I, I know that military option is no option at all. Because, for example, the, the, the capital city Seoul is only about uh, 30 miles away from the 38 parallel. So, so that means if North Korea want to launch a attack, it, it's going to be disastrous. Yeah, the the one ten ten million people living in Seoul, which is so close to the border. Okay, next question, Jonathan. I'll get you next. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, quick question. Uh, I was uh, skyping with a client uh, in um, Shanghai last week. Had a great connection, no problem. But um, uh, tried to send a. Um, a YouTube video, non-political uh, business, and uh, uh, he, he skyped back to me. He said, "I uh, can't accept the uh, can't accept the video." So uh, when he comes back to the states next week, uh, he's based here, Chinese citizen, works for a multinational. So I was just wondering if you could talk about the the uh, social media uh, wall, I guess, in China. Well, I think every country has its own rules. The the uh, some U.S. internet company uh, is not good do, doing good, good good job in China. That's that's right. Like Google, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, Google is is out of the Chinese market few years ago. Where I think if they follow the rules, it, it should be okay. Yeah. Well. But this is not political. This is just a no, no. And nothing to do, nothing to do with the with the politics. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Jonathan. Yeah. Thank you. When the Olympics were in China, uh, the stadium was uh, absolutely magnificent. It was beautiful, and it was in the shape of a bird cage. So it was development. But it was also a combination of development and poetry. Would you suggest to us to read a Chinese poet or musician that represents this principle? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Sorry that I'm not an expert on, on music or art. No. But certainly I will try to, 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 to find... Uh, I'll give you my email. Yes, I will try to find a website for you. I'll try my best. Great. Who hasn't had a question? That's really a masterpiece, yes. I, I you, who has not had a question? You already have one. You have one in the back of him, too. Um, I'd like to know one thing myself. China has gone on to do a lot of, you know, with, with development, it means electricity, it means oil, it means a lot of things. How is China going to address the, its fossil fuels? It's energy future. I know you've opened up the Three Gorges Dam, and you've got 300 scientists working on some advanced nuclear reactors. Can you comment on, on the, the future of energy in China a little bit, please? Yes, where we think climate change is real. It's real. It's a big thing. And uh, the Chinese government uh, really uh, thinks it's important. And 
where in terms of the international cooperation, we think uh, every country should get involved and work together. Where for China itself, uh, the government has come up with a lot of the, uh, the commitment to try to reduce the, the, the carbon emission. And for example, let me give you an example, you know, uh, how we take it so seriously. The, we think electric car is it, it's a new trend, electric car. So, so here you have the Tesla, right? But in China, Chinese government uh, encouraging every car company to, to produce electric car, 100% electric car. And the uh, Chinese government is giving the very heavy subsidy to the uh, electric car producer and user, user as well. So if, if I want to buy electric car in Beijing, uh, even electric, electric car is expensive, but I will get uh, a lot of the uh, subsidy from the government. So, so that means reduction of the, of the uh, money I'm going to pay. So we take the very seriously. What do we get for oil? How about some here, Henry? What does China get oil from? So we, we are importing... All right. Answer the question. Yeah, we are we are importing half the oil from abroad, uh, from the Middle East, from Soviet Union, oil and gas, the Soviet Union, some from Africa, some from the Latin America, Australia. Is China have a lot of reserves of oil? Okay. Mike, okay. Mike, Mike, okay. We're, we're talking, talking about energy. We got one last question here, Henry. All right, Henry, please give us. Yeah, I uh, talking about Chinese outdoors. Are you familiar with the person called Song Hongbing, Chinese economic writer? Okay. Do you know the name? Yes. Did you read his books? Yes. Okay. I read them as well. However, as I heard, please confirm that he is the most popular or one of the most popular economical, uh, political writers specializing in, in international finances. Is it correct? Uh, not really. Okay. It <laughs> used to be popular a few years ago, but no, now, now, so I'm, I'm, now he's getting I'm a bit uh, uh, less popular than before. Okay. All right. The reason I'm asking is because he's writing very interesting things about the United States. His books are translated to Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese. One book was translated in French and in Polish. Why is not available in English? Do you know any comments about it? Well, I, I did read this book uh, a few years ago when I was in Beijing. And uh, they also raised uh, up a very interesting issue you know, on, on the finance. Uh, but I think he concentrated too much on the negative side of the finance. Does it keep, it's, it's they come up with the conspiracy, uh, a fo focus on conspiracy. Which I, I, I don't agree with that. There is the theory that he's writing influence the uh, economic policy or financial policy of Chinese government. Is it true? Well, for the other addition, I haven't read yet. Okay. I'd like to thank our ambassador for a good speech. All right. Thank you. 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 Comments if you'd like to. I'd like to have your assistant uh, Gary also address us if he has anything he would like to say for two to three minutes and then. Well, let's thank Gary too. Set this up. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry that uh, I cannot uh, stay here for long. Yeah, I have another engagement in the CSO. There are uh, national theaters, uh, art troops coming to have a performance. I have to go there. Sorry for that. But again, you know, it's my first time being here with you. I I'm so happy. And, uh, and also I'm happy to, to tell you about what's going on in China and uh, what's going on between China and United States. We think uh, China-US relations is, is the single most important bilateral relations in the world. Yeah. You, you agree with that? Mm. So I think uh, uh, we need just a talk. We think everybody should, uh, uh, should contribute to the peaceful uh, development of the China-US relations. And uh, hope next time we will see you again. We'll have, uh, we'll have video ready by uh, 
this before long again. Thank you guys very much. Let's give a round of applause. I'd like to thank you again for coming on out. And that's the bottom one there. Good, good, good. All right. Most of you know what's next. That's our infamous rebuttal period. I know several people are here ready, are, are chomping at the bits to give a uh, rebuttal. What we'll do is we're going to go four minutes each. We do have some extra time, but uh, I'll stick to the four-minute deal so we can get everybody up here because I know a lot of you are going on. So if you want to speak, come on up. We'll just kind of get a line going. We got. I'll try to pull out a couple extra chairs if we need it. But uh, let's get up here, and I know, Sid, you got jumping at the bit to go. So why don't you go first? Four minutes. I'd also like to give Karina a hand. I normally do this stuff for her. You know, I need more than college, but she's been generously helping out with the camera work. So again, let's give Karina a quick hand. All right, let's get on with the rebuttals. Of the Chinese economy is a hybrid of capitalism and socialism. Because to begin with, it was a very poor country. It had a very small working class. Oh. It um, had this very small working class, and Mao Zedong didn't agree with Russia that a, that a revolution could be had without the workers participating and leading the struggle. And if you um, know, notice how China became richer, it had to go through a stage of capitalism first. So it developed a state economy run by the Communist Party and the, and the private economy run by capitalists. But the capitalists that came in to China, like the United States and other countries, they had a they had to do what they call transfer their, their uh, knowledge of the technology to the Chinese if they want to participate in their economy. So they got a lot of the uh, technology in order to develop the state as they knew it at that time. And they built up their economy that way. Because being a very poor agriculture society, their working class was extremely small. And according to so-called Western or uh, materialistic uh, philosophy, they, they needed that technological technology in order to develop their economy. That's, you know, that was, that was uh, the way to do it. But under Marx, he thought that the first countries that would go socialist would be a highly developed economy, like the United States or Germany. But of course, you can't go strictly by ideology. You have to go by the conditions at hand, which are the material conditions at hand. And that's what they went by. So anybody that says that uh, somebody brought out about uh, Buddhism or something like that, where they said, that somebody could develop into a uh, Buddhist, whatever it was. And that's materialism. That has nothing to do with materialism. Materialism is the conditions they uh, inherit from the previous uh, society. Marxism was materialism. Okay. 
All right, our, uh, all right, next. You've got the timer here, so go ahead and start. Okay, give me a one minute uh, notice. Okay, I will. Uh, of course, our speaker is gone, but I, we already thanked him. I thought it was uh, quite interesting. He says I he's going to watch. I learned some history about uh, China and Japan. Some of it I knew, some of it I didn't. It's from his point of view. And China and Taiwan, some of it I knew, and some of it's from his point of view. It's very interesting. But uh, North Korea, well, of course we all know that North Korea <coughs> invaded South Korea, right? Oh, 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 looking back at the uh, flyer from the North Park Mayfair, uh, North Park, uh, Albany Park, North Park Mayfair, Neighbors for Peace and Justice, they have a different point of view. I don't say I agree with every word of it, but I think you might want to take a look at it. Uh, of course, I, I just went back and read in Kenneth uh, Davis's book, Don't Know Much About History, it says clearly North Korea invaded South Korea. Well, Howard Zen's book, People's History of the United States, doesn't totally agree with that. My point is this. If you really want to know history, if I really want to know history, I better read a lot of sources and compare them. Not everybody agrees. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Okay. Thank you for Next one. Mr. Flores. Hey, how you doing? Well, this is the second time we've had a spy here. A guy taking our pictures and everything was recorded by them, which is okay because that's what diplomats do. It is a weird thing about spying that if you are a spy and are caught, you can face death, no trial, torture, but if you're a diplomat, you get to walk. You get caught and they take you to a plane, you fly home, which I've always thought was fascinating. Another fascinating thing, it's a theory I've come up with lately, um, and I like to have theories about things. Um, we look into Russia's eyes and we are repulsed. The Russians had the tool to mass accumulate everyone's emails and spy on everyone, and we stole it from them. Now what were the Russians using that tool for? And yet we look at the Russians and go, how can you spy on everyone? And then we took that tool, and what did we do with it? The same thing. What am I getting to? Japan will not admit that it committed atrocities against China in World War II. Right? And he said that is part of the reason that Japan and China don't get along. And it's true. I'm not going to dispute it. However, what does China do? China says Tiananmen Square didn't happen. In fact, officially, they say it was completely concocted by the CIA. Okay? It's the same thing. They don't see it, but it's the same block. They're looking into each other's eyes, and they're seeing themselves. And they are repulsed by that. How could you spy on your own people? Well, you stole the tool from us, and now you're spying on your own people. How could you deny atrocities happened? Well, Tiananmen Square was completely created by the CIA. This is the real problem. Another theory I have. When I first told Studs Terkel I was a libertarian, I was the first one that he ever met. And he said to me, so you don't believe in any government at all? You don't believe in any rules and regulations? And I said to him, what is the goal of communism? 
oh, well, that's the withering away of the state when there's no more government, when there's no more military, and there's no need for one. And AT&T and the coal companies and the oil companies under communism will be free to do everything they want because the state will have withered away. I'm a libertarian. I do believe in government. I do believe in regulations. To me, the idea that we're going to reach a magic point where the state and the military will just dissolve, wither away, was Karl Marx's words. And the coal companies and the oil companies will just do what's right for centuries to come is in fact insane. Thank you. All right. Next, please. Four minutes. Please be clear and concise. No. Four. I'm Ellen Corley. I've spoken here a few times. I believe in this free speech forum and uh, actually have an idea of a another College of Complex down on Well Street. There's an empty room and we need another one. Um, but the subject, I guess, I, that comes to mind I want to talk about is, um, I study the deep state and uh, Peter Dale Scott and, and um, Oliver Stone, the untold history of the United States. And it, I, it's helping me see the Marxist point of view and really how United States plays a very terrible role. I mean, I, so I looked at this book yesterday that explained so much that this is sociology interpretation of war that Marx, um, Lenin learned from Marx that theory of war is that the, the corporations and the, the business, you know, these are the bourgeois, they work together to create war, the people don't really want war. I mean, so this Marxian interpretation of war makes sense to me. I, I don't understand why we've been at wars for the last hundred years. So I keep looking and can I stop it? How? And then people go, you can't stop it. The deep state, you know, Wall Street and uh, the CIA keep you know, they're, they're, they got all the money, all the power, they, all the politicians, uh, and David's going to have a hard time fighting back. Actually, that's why I am wearing this shirt, Refuse Fascism. I was meeting, Doug was there today, we're on the 4th. We're trying to get everybody to just stand together and refuse fascism. We're coming on November 4th at Federal Plaza, 1 o'clock. But if nothing else, start Federal Plaza, Jackson and um, State or something. Okay, and um, from just one to four, but just being there in solidarity, it's time to start waking up because they really did, we've been kind of misinformed, disinformed about Marxism, about, you know, and you know, who are they? came up with this, uh, Rockefeller came up with the idea, here's our education, we're the shining democracy, capitalism, you know, these are sacred cows, you can't say anything bad about them, and we all need a job, we need some money, so we desperately try to play along. But it, it really, we could have a socialist thing, and it would really work out a lot better for us. Um, you know, schools, and we've got to... Once you realize that it really is fascism, capitalism is kind of creating war, all these wars. This guy Anthony Sutton wrote that he studied Russia and he said what really happened is that the, the Ashkenazi Jews and the you know, Rothschilds and the United States at the end of World War I you know, kind of made a deal. We're going to keep this war going. We're going to fund both sides of the wars and all the elections. And then, and so we send our little CIA people down 30 to seconds. separate the people, the Shia and the Sunni and the communist and the, the country so that we can overthrow them and put in our, you know, put in our, you know, torture them and, and take over them and get them into debt for our banks. And Rothschild wins. We've got to stand up and say something. 
All right. All right. Yeah. Four minutes, Dennis. Are you ready? My name is Dennis Nelson. I am a member of the Chicago based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. There is no real debate with nuclear free versus nuclear thorium. The nuclear free pathway is far superior to nuclear thorium, enhancing our economic well being, energy security, climate protection, environmental quality, and public health. The position of NEIS is that China's nuclear thorium program is unneeded, unwise, and should be abandoned immediately. A commercial liquid molten salt thorium reactor is only a proposed elusive concept that is still non-existent. It will have unresolved proliferation, radioactive waste, decommissioning, and safety problems. The higher costs and longer lead times or lag times preclude it from becoming a realistic solution to our climate crisis. Our world is now experiencing energy transition away from inherently dirtier nuclear power and fossil fuels and toward an inherently cleaner economy using increasing amounts of renewable sources and energy efficiency. Here and now, energy efficient buildings are an integral part of any nuclear free pathway. I attended a meeting sponsored by Environmental Progress Illinois, which is actually a pro nuclear front group at Northwestern University's Morrell School of Journalism in Chicago's downtown loop area. Afterwards, two members of the Thorium Energy Alliance, a pro nuclear thorium advocacy group, were overheard talking. And neither of them were Tim Bolger because Tim wasn't there. And one asked the other, do they want us to live in caves? I almost hit the floor because this pro-nuclear propaganda tactic is an oldie but goodie that my ears had not detected in the longest time. The original version goes something like this. Going without nuclear power means li having to live in caves with candles. Let's modify that to include living and working in caves. An energy efficient residential or commercial building is the furthest thing from a dark, damp, dreary, and uncomfortable cave. In discussing energy efficient buildings for China, let's quote Mark L. Clifford, a journalist and the executive director of the Asia Business Council in Hong Kong. Quote, the technology is available for more energy efficient buildings using myriad new and higher technology materials, better design, and more efficient operations. The event of green buildings does not mean a new age of austerity. It does not mean hot, stuffy office buildings where workers swelter in Asia's never-ending tropical summers or shiver in its bitter northern winters. Green buildings can in fact be more pleasant than conventional buildings. They use more natural light and they are kept at a more comfortable temperature. The use of interior green walls made up of plants produces fresher air and a more pleasant environment. Moreover, even ignoring the dramatic environmental benefits, it is cheaper to put money into more energy efficient buildings than to build new coal-fired power plants to provide power for conventional inefficient buildings. In China, fabricating new buildings to higher energy efficiency standards is more cost effective than retrofitting old ones. To be more exact, the cost of saving a megawatt of demand by constructing and operating a building more efficiently is one-third less than, than that of adding another megawatt of electricity by building more generating capacity, and that is not accounting for the environmental benefit of burning less fossil fuel. Yet China currently is building the equivalent of two or more 500 megawatt power plants every week. With China responsible for more than half, half of all the floor space built annually in the world, more energy efficient buildings are the most cost effective way to address energy and environmental challenges. The same is true throughout developing Asia." Unquote. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Jonathan, you're next, right? Jonathan, you're next, right? Or whatever. Go ahead. Oh, who's next? Uh, this is a great speaker tonight. So kudos to everybody who uh, made that happen. The schedule. There's a Chinese uh, ideograph for the word crisis, and it's formed by two characters. Uh, one is opportunity, and one is danger. 
And we find ourselves in a time right now in the world, not just in the United States, where we're faced with a real crisis that luckily uh, a lot of us are talking about it in a very civil way when uh, agreeing that we need a solution, that uh, we need to talk about opportunities that are there, and we also have to be honest about the danger that exists. Uh, China spends between 190 and 250 billion a year on military spending. The United States spends between 600 and 650 billion a year on military spending. So uh, when I've heard people either talking about how uh, they think China is somehow a, a threat or the U.S. is this innocent bystander and the China is this big bully on the, the global block. Uh, just let those numbers sink in to uh, figure out whether that's uh, true or not. Uh, I think the Chinese people and the American people are, are sick and tired both of being told to be divided and conquered from each other. Yeah. And uh, I think the Chinese people and the American people are seeing that this crisis was not created by everyday families and everyday community members. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Slim Brundage once said, uh, you can't stop, and for those who don't know, he's the founder of the College of Complexes, uh, affectionately known as the janitor, because he always kept his uh, working class solidarity uh, front and center in everything he did in his life. You can't stop an ideology with bullets or buy peace with dollars. But that's exactly what uh, governments all over the world, not just this crazy current uh, administration in the United States is trying to do. Uh, and I think we should, we should really take to heart who we are. You know, China, what they're trying to achieve is a genuine balance between development and equality. They're trying to find a genuine balance between democracy and socialism, and socialism not defined by some boogeyman, scary uh, monster that you see in a Halloween uh, movie. Uh, you know, democracy, uh, democracy and socialism, socialism is defined by people uh, like Frederick Douglass, like Harriet Tubman, like Jane Addams, like Clara Barton, like Abraham Lincoln, like Eleanor Roosevelt, and yes, also by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Uh, you know, what we're talking about is things that need new vocabulary. It's things that don't have a word for it yet. Civilizationism, equalityism, common sense-ism, we the peopleism, participatory democracyism. Uh, that just barely scratches the surface of what we're all saying. It doesn't have to be like this. It can be like this. So I'll finish with uh, this brief poem. And I gave a copy to the speaker tonight because I was really glad he was here and I was really glad we started early. <laughs> Uh, when it's this late, we don't call it night. When it's this starlit, we can see with closed eyes. Are we ready for our wings to rise? We the people are not going north, south, east, or west. We are going sky. Peace on earth, we the people. Six words affirm what keeps us afloat. Someday the tables will turn to be free and equal. How this world yearns for a season of soul. Thanks to the speaker. Before I begin what I was going to say, I would like to address myself to the anti-Semitic remarks that were made a few minutes ago. I am an Ashkenazic Jew and proudly so, and I deeply resent the comments that somehow Ashkenazic Jews and the Rothschilds we're all responsible for the wars that have been going on. Okay. Wars have many fathers and mothers. And Ashkenazic Jews have been fighting war, fighting against war, for quite some time. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Now, now started officially. Now, with regard to our visitor tonight, I found him intelligent, and I found the president's presentation to be excellent. Yes. I did not entirely agree with him when I, when I asked him about North about the situation in Korea, but I did not entirely disagree with him either. Um, to be sure, Kim Jong-un is a nut. But having said that, it doesn't necessarily do us any good to have a president like Donald Trump 
who's at least as much of a nut as Kim Jong Un, right? <laughs> and who's busy calling him what is it, Rocket Man, and all the rest Little of this stuff. Little Rocket Man, thank you. <laughs> One wonders what would happen if Kim Jong Un were dealing with a real president, like say John Kennedy or Dwight Eisenhower. Thank you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right, Charlie. <laughs> All right, I don't have much to contribute tonight, except thanks for Tim and Andy for helping us get our act together on time. Karina, too. All right, thank the people for help out. Let's see, I'll be very quick. I've only got two things to comment on. Anytime I discuss China, it always comes to mind a historical event called the Long March. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with this event. There's actually only about one or two books uh, written about it uh, in English. Nevertheless, the communists in, in the 40s there um, were at war with the government and the communists were doing too well and they were actually in retreat in a long march in the middle of winter. Um, I don't remember the distance, it's been a number of years, but they even went to the most inhospitable train they could find, thinking they could get away from the enemy pursuing them. And it went on and on. Uh, and eventually they did get away, but the trek itself, they started out with somewhere around 80,000 troops and I could stand corrected, but I believe the figure is by the time when they stopped, they had about 3,000 left. Oh, God. And the thing about Chairman Mao came along in the midst of this uh, assumed leadership. But the one thing I still remember, they, he said at, at the end of the march, he says, are we stronger now or weaker? And, and definitely they went on to win the war uh, in 49, uh, dis despite this um, hardship. Now, on a more positive note, anytime I think of China, and I didn't get a chance to ask a speaker, I always think of their favorite character they have, uh, is uh, Li Feng. <laughs> and I don't know if you know who Li Feng is, I know. but he was a young man who tragically died and at a young age in an accident, he was in the army. They were doing some infrastructure work. But he is held up as the pinnacle, perfect young communist. Learn from and Conrad Lee Fung. He, uh, yes, they have Lee Fung Day. Uh, he would do things for other people in his unit. He, and then he would do things like he would take his pay and he read, there's all, oh, there's a zillion stories about him. He read about a family whose house burned down, so he sent them his entire paycheck and things like this. But they're wonderful stories. They've been made into movies. But if you have occasion to look up Li Fung, I would highly recommend. They have all sorts of stories, even for young children. I, I remember they like they're given for discussion. Like Li Fung was going to school and he found a very valuable pen. And rather than keep it for itself, he turned it into the teacher so that they could go find the real owner, the rightful owner of the pad. Little didactic stories like this. Anyhow, thanks for coming out tonight, folks. Take care. What's your schedule? Go ahead. All right. Four minutes. A little less. The, um, I'm going to bring up North Korea because they were, yeah, obviously this is so a weird. So this is one thing tip, why people don't like Trump. Typical, why are we even bothering with this crampy little country, North Korea, that could cause so many problems. That I completely agree with the rational argument that they want to have a strong military and nuclear bombs to protect an America or another country for, from invading them and it, it creates a stalemate and for this president 
to put people in danger and start threatening Little Rocket Man and the guy's a nut job and it's just stupid. I don't see any worthwhile gain, uh, you know, uh, threatening North Korea or this Little Rocket Man. So, um, the, you know, these Chinese guys were pretty good, but, you know, they seem like they hold our cards very close to their vests. They don't talk out, you know, about much. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's great that their economy is booming, you know. Pay somebody a dollar a day, I guess. You are going to sell cheap products around the world. Um, I was going to ask him about human rights and where that's at, but obviously I would get a close to the best uh, answer. So. He's a diplomat. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's <laughs> what do you expect? Totally, totally <laughs> company line, right? So, okay, that's about it. Uh, but Trump is tr that's typical of why Trump's an idiot. It's like bothering <laughs> North okay, Korea. Okay, next. Was <laughs> that four minutes? No, but yeah. 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 I always get yeah. You guys only give me two. Mike, I'm going to give you a rebuttal to your rebuttal. Um, my, my question is when did the Soviet Union threaten us with nuclear attack? When did the Soviet Union threaten us with nuclear attack? Mike, you said never, right? You said never. The president of North Korea threatened the United States of America with a nuclear attack on Inauguration Day. But you guys were so in shock over Hillary losing that you didn't notice that for the first time in history, we were threatened with a nuclear attack. Now I have another question just out of curiosity. I have another question out of curiosity. And by the way, we know why a certain sports figure goes to North Korea. We know why if you go on YouTube, you can see that uh, basketball player on video incoherent and obviously high on crystal methadrine in North Korea. That is what they sell. Now I have a question for you. Who else here in the room was invited to meet with the man who just gave the talk? Do you have a card? Can you show me the card? And that makes me wrong? I've been three times. I got one. Show yeah, so do I. <laughs> Oh, he thinks he's a big shot. All right. All right. Next. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I'm going oh, to the Chinese oh, I got it. Four minutes. Oh, 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 Order. 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 Let the speaker speak. Okay, four minutes, Andy. I'd like to make a few observations of things that... I've talked about this book for years and years and years. This is the 41st anniversary edition. Last year was the 40th of Censored News. They published the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. This book has a couple of chapters in it that describes the role of the mainstream media now. Their role is to maintain people in a bubble of ignorance compared to what other people know around the world. Number one, a great poisonous flag, a tree, was planted in this country on 9-11. And the myth was sold by the media. It was like a Hollywood movie. Every piece of 9-11, of the official story, has been proven by hundreds of thousands of scientists and researchers all over the world. Military intelligence analysts, physicians who doctors, society's elders, architects and engineers, firefighters from 9-11 Truth, veterans from 9-11 Truth. We're up to about half of the American public, 50% of the American public knows the truth about 9-11. There was an inside job done by the Bush administration with help from a couple other countries. All right, please, one full at a time. Sorry about the interruption. What we see here is certain people cannot handle reality and when you try to introduce them to reality, they become very agitated or they will shout in my face. Um, it's a, Professor Griffin wrote 11 books on 9-11 and many of his books describe how people come to believe religious or other kinds of mythology that has no basis in reality. 
here we are talking about North Korea threatening the United States. That is a total, utter crack. Since 1985, it's been known. It's been known that you, if you want to bomb a city, you don't send it through the air with a missile. Why not? You stick it in a knapsack and deliver it on the back of a motorcycle. We have compact portable mm -hmm. atomic weapons. The blast that was dropped on Hiroshima has been condensed down the size of a football. So in 1985, a report was published that said any country that has a dozen of these things can eliminate any other country. So this is all huge theater, like one, one, one author said, 12 bombs, 12 properly outfitted motorcycles in any country on Earth cease to exist as a place for human habitation. You don't need 5,000 missiles like what the Russians and the Americans have. That's, that's welfare for the defense companies, just total welfare. Uh, a question later. So, no, yeah, some of you may be familiar with a concept called Google. Well, how do you think the Internet works? They got satellites. There are satellites all over the globe. Those satellites can read a license plate on a car from orbit if there's no clouds. Those satellites will instantly pinpoint the launch of a missile. Any missile is launched toward the United States and you know instantly where it came from. That would be walking up to the average Chicago cop surrounded by six of his, his buddies and pulling out a gun and saying, I'm holding you up. They just blow them away. No question about it. Black people are getting blown away without weapons. Cops just walk up to them and blow them away. And our country hasn't faced the reality of that. 30 seconds. All right, 30 seconds. The guy can fire missiles. The, the bottom line is, if you know, the United States will not attack any country that has a nuclear capability because they know if, if we attack them, the nuclear bombs aren't coming over by missiles. They're going to be coming in by boats smuggling across the Mexican border or whatever and driven into a city and set off with a phone call. That's the risk you risk if you attack anybody with nuclear weapons. Is that clear to everybody? What is it doesn't matter how they deliver the bomb. Well, it doesn't to the people that are incinerated. Charlie well, said, what difference is it? I can fire a missile, so what? Well, for the first place... I can afford it? Charlie, let me answer. For the first place, you can shoot down missiles with the anti-missile. If, if the, the country only has one, two, three, then they're no threat to any nuclear power like the United States. This is, this is all spelled out in this book and others. What we're seeing in the Trump administration is total theater to keep us away from learning okay. what's going on. Okay? Time's up, and somebody Andy. is shaking his hand back there. We, we have people I recognize in this audience, won't mention any names, that are out of touch with observable reality. Okay. I, I, I join you, I uh, invite you to join the rest of us in the real world anytime you want to. Thank you. All right. All right. As much as I would like to debate Dennis tonight on his remarks about nuclear power, I don't think that's going to be a good format at this point. I will say that I have taken an intense interest in China over the last couple of weeks before Mr. Liu came in and, and, and talked about it tonight. And I remember one thing. China right now is focused on developing countries. And what they're doing around the world is they're giving almost for free the infrastructure required for them to prosper. This one belt, one road policy that they have is uh, Basically, for example, in the Karakoram Highway that links Pakistan to China, they initially built it in the 60s as a gift to the country to get their commerce and trade going between Pakistan, between Pakistan I'm sorry, I think it's Pakistan and China. And uh, the thing is, they've just also, in the last five years, redone it, four lane it and made it better, and they don't put the same restrictions on the use of this infrastructure as what would happen if the United States came in and gave the aid as well. What they're doing is they're just basically, uh, even, in, even in this one belt, one road policy, they've been building the infrastructure out of a lot of the Central Asian countries at virtually no cost to those Asian countries. And that's why there is another way to look at development. 
you know, we always proclaim democracy, we proclaim capitalism, we proclaim all this. And you know, I do believe the United States is right in a lot of in a lot of respects. But there has been, as Mr. Lou alluded to, renationalization of industries, uh, a more control of what is called the commanding heights of the economy. And they're trying to get the pent up consumer demand in China up, up a little bit more to Western standards. And their debt has just basically doubled in the last two years, the rate of increase on it. Uh, they're trying their best to avoid a recession, but it's in my own opinion that what they're doing now is a lot like what Japan did in the early 80s, and they may be going through a long economic, uh, what we call, like the like happened in Japan, the decade of the lost prosperity. China is a very wise power. They, for example, if you take a look at the rare earth metals, which is basically contained in almost everything you have, from cell phones to your electric cell and car batteries, China has a monopoly on production right now. Why? Because they underpriced us. And when we got underpriced, we basically closed our minds to, net, to a, a very good nationalistic industry. And we're finally beginning to realize that uh, they're now up in the price, making a lot of money on this stuff. And they also control the means of production with these things. So they have a monopoly right now on rare earth metals. I have the feeling though that's going to change because a lot of the American companies don't exactly like dealing with, with China on this stuff. They'd rather be doing it in America or some other country. And the Lemley Pass mine is going to be reopening very soon to help counter that production. I like what China's done. I'm generally, you know, in a much agreement with the ambassador, but we all know that government control does not work. And I'm out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, we've got, still got a little time. So if anybody else wants to speak, please come up. If there's no more rebuttals, uh, you know, if everybody's satisfied, let's we'll gamble it out tonight and head home early because we got here. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. All right.